What's going on, Knicks fans? Welcome to another episode of Cap Rules Everything Around Me Cream. Get the money, dollar dollar bills, y'all. I am Jeremy Cohen. I'm really excited about this one. We are a little over a month away, a little under a month, I should say, from the NBA trade deadline. It will be February 9th, ending at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm sure there's a lot to talk about, and I'm really excited to, to get down to it. I want to start off with one thing. And I've been kind of thinking about this and waiting for the opportunity to discuss it in more of a longer form. So it's really about what the end goal for the Knicks is, right? Like, okay, you get to later down the line, you would envision it as a contender, but you don't really know how to get there. And the steps between now and then are a little murky and it's tough to say. Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking. So earlier this past year, really before the beginning of the season, um, those of you who watch Knicks Film School, you'll know that I have talked about OG Ananobi before. And when I first started, it was really just, this is a nice young player who he's, he's going to opt out of his player option in the 2024 offseason. There's a reason why there's interest for him. The Knicks should entertain getting him. And I've kept that in the back of my mind throughout the season, but I still was trying to figure out the direction. And so what I did was I would just, I would stare at the cap sheet. I'm trying to look for something, look for a path. It's like a map, but but figuring out where the direction leads to is a little bit tricky. I think I know where it goes. I, th I think I've cracked it. And I will be saying more and more as time goes on. I'm going to be a little bit more cryptic just because it, it's all about phases. But the one thing I want to point out is if you look at what the Knicks have done, and we've talked about this a little bit, John and, and I have talked about it. If you look at what the Knicks have done, They've basically structured themselves for 2024 free agency, right? I mean, you look at 2020. Well, there really weren't any five-year contracts that would go into the 2024 season, so you're fine. 2021, the only like the, with the free agent class that the Knicks had, and yeah, it wasn't a great summer at all. Turned out pretty poorly. Not a single dollar was in guaranteed money in the 2024 offseason until. The Knicks extended Julius Randle. Now, it made sense. He was coming off of an all-NBA team. Yet, you, In my mind, it was the right call. As he's performing now, it seems like the right call. I certainly hope it continues to be the case, but that's why the Knicks committed money to it. And, you know, there are all these other cost-saving cost moves, right? Like trading back, you actually save money down the line. Trading out of a draft, you save money. And it's this whole philosophy of, they continue to maybe try to find avenues to get cap space, but they're not going to be able to create a lot of cap space because there's also Jalen Brunson and Mitchell Robinson and RJ Barrett. And so it's basically the way I saw it was, and we'll get more into the math for future cap or no caps. I promise we will either do something after the deadline because something crazy happened and, and we'll figure it out, or we'll talk about it in the summer when there's plenty to talk about, or we won't talk about it at all because perhaps a player like OG and is on another team. But the way that I've seen it is, you know, I've talked about it as the Knicks are going to be over the cap in 2023 and they'll try to create cap space in 2024 and they could still do that. But the one thing that I should say is I still do believe that based on how the math is shaking out, look, anything can happen. There's plenty of time between now and 18 months from now, but to me, the way that I've been reading it is that seems like where the direction is, is starting to go. And then it sets off a chain reaction. We can, again, talk about that later. But in terms of how this works, that's the opportunity. Like, that's the reason why the Knicks would not have cap space in 2024. And the reason that's important is because if the Knicks don't intend to have cap space that season um, or that offseason, it changes the dynamic of this year, this trade deadline, because suddenly you don't need to try to create a situation that leaves you with more cap space later. You might actually be able to just keep going over the cap depending on what you do. So like I've said, we can talk more about it. I just felt that as I've been reviewing this and I wanted more of a long form way of kind of feeling it out, that that would be a scenario in which case the exact opposite of what I'm saying happens where the Knicks don't plan on being a cap space team because they don't need to, and they can still make their trades and do whatever they need to do. So. That's the one big thing. 
And if we have anything from our esteemed guests who are joining us, um, then we can get started with comments So and questions. Looking forward to all of them. So what we got uh, from Jessica. Uh, Jessica Elsner, Jeremy, why are you so awesome? Jessica, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'll just I'll just take the compliment. So thank you very much. Um, from Jason M. Cam won't be traded until Jay Crowder and Boyan, Bog Boyan Bogdanovich are traded. The same teams that want Cam want those players more. Thoughts? It, it could happen. You know, I mean, there's the report that Michael Scotto came out with today that said the Knicks are now listening with two second round picks being the return for Cam Reddish. And I've been trying to think of ways that the Knicks could still get a first round pick involving Cam Reddish. Now, I am not saying the Knicks getting a first round pick for Cam Reddish. And so it'd be basically the type of scenario where, you know, I think the Bucks and the Lakers were two teams that were mentioned, right? So it's trying to find unwanted salary in other places and giving a little bit more on the Knicks end in order to get something done. So when you think about it like that, okay, well, what's the type of move that could be? be? So Milwaukee, right? Let's say Milwaukee wants Cam Reddish. Um, and Milwaukee's in this interesting spot because they don't have cap space. They have to pay Chris Middleton. If he walks, then it really doesn't help them at all. They need to find ways to create you know, talent. And, and the trade route is pretty much the best way to do it. Free agency is a little tricky too because they're they are in Milwaukee. They might have issues with tax and so on and so forth. But in terms of how the Knicks could come into play here. So another team that works out well that might be interested is the Utah Jazz. We talked about them a couple weeks ago, myself and John. And the thought process there was, okay, well, Cam Reddish is making, you know, well, five, six-ish million dollars. What if you move him to a team like Milwaukee? You know, you could trade two second round picks and salary filler in this case, which would be George Hill. Like that could be a return that you get. Cool. Okay. I mean, I would imagine the Knicks would just, in that case, maybe they'd waive George Hill. Maybe they wouldn't. He's expiring. Maybe they feel he'd help them, but I don't see how he would because they, they're not going to insert him into the starting or into any rotation. So then it's the thought process of involving a team like Utah, where Utah has Rudy Gay. He makes a little bit more than Cam Reddish does, and he makes more than George Hill. And so it's basically going to Utah and saying, listen, Utah, you don't want Rudy Gay on your roster next year. We all know it. He's got that player option. He's going to opt in because why wouldn't he? He's in his mid-30s. That's money that he would be leaving on the table if he didn't. So what about this? We, as the Knicks, will take on Rudy Gay. And you get George Hill as an expiring, and you can just cut him loose. Um, and Cam Reddish will go to Milwaukee. And in terms of pick compensation, here's a thought. You could get the two second round picks that the Bucks were willing to give us that are like 2027, 20, 2020. Again, this is all just a hypothetical. You get those. On top of that, what we as the Knicks can do, we own your second round pick in 2024. Now, we recognize you're probably going to go into a rebuild. You're treading water right now, but it's very easy to strip the roster down to the studs and be able to tank. And guess what? You probably want to be a bottom 10 team next year because you don't have your pick if you finish 11th or worse in the reverse standings. So here's what we can do. We'll give you that second round pick, which will essentially be a pick in the 30s. You'll get two future second round picks from the Bucks, which they could be good because Giannis, who knows how long he stays, they might be average. They might be bad. It's the mystery box. But what we want is we want to take your worst 2023 first round pick, which would be the Brooklyn Nets pick, because the Jazz don't necessarily need to have three first round picks. They might be looking to, you know, do something. And, and granted, they could trade up. Um, they could take a draft and stash. There are other ways around it that are just fine. They don't have to do this, but it's basically and you could do the same thing with the Lakers, right? Instead of George Hill and 2027, 2028 second round picks, it's. Kendrick Nunn and 2025 and 2027 second, you know, or maybe if the Knicks are trying to get something where they go to one of the 2025 picks, maybe it's the Cavs pick and they ask them, them being the jazz to heavily protect it, like really heavily top 20. That's the sort of thing where I feel like you want to move Cam Reddish for, where you can still 
You send out seconds, but you're still getting some sort of first back. Cam alone isn't worth it. In terms of what Jason's saying, yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible that they wait. It's the other thought of how motivated are these teams to do something, right? Like the Lakers, they've been winning games. That's great. They've been winning games while they haven't been healthy. At the same time, do they want to take a step forward and say, you know what? Let's just not waste time. Let's just, let's do what we need to do. Do a team like the Bucks, you know, as they're like, this is their time to capitalize. Kevin Durant is injured. Um, they are very much in peril of falling towards four or five. If you feel like Cam Reddish can be better for your team than George Hill, do the trade now. So the Knicks have also jumped ahead of the market in the past. They have tried to facilitate deals and they've been successful getting them done a month or so earlier. Now, considering we're at that monthly point, it is still early. So the, the market still probably does need some time to breathe. Um, so Jason, I understand what you're saying. I just wonder if some teams might say, you know what, we're out of the larger names. Let's just target the small guys and go from there. So we shall see. Dirty Dancer. It is important to ink IQ or OB before they hit restricted free agency. Well, if you kind of see how the Knicks have operated, they have been very much about, we want to lock down our players. We're cool paying a slight premium if that's the case, but we want to have them under contract. The difference, of course, here was Mitchell Robinson, and the reason the Knicks didn't do it was it opened up cap space for them to sign Jalen Brunson. It would have been a lot harder if the Knicks had done it where they signed Mitchell Robinson last season, and then you had this whole scenario. And Robinson wound up making more money than he was uh, permitted by the CBA in the last season. So yes, it is important for the Knicks to lock up these players. That being said, are both of these players still going to be with the Knicks? Is one of these players traded? If they're building around Julius Randle, how much of a role does Obi Toppin have here moving forward? I, I mean, I still think that if Julius is the guy for the Knicks, argue rightly or wrongly whether that's the case, be my guess. But if Julius Randle is the player and is not being moved, it doesn't make sense to keep having Obi Toppin here. And if you're going to keep playing Obi Toppin for 15, 18 minutes a game, you can get not similar production necessarily, but you can get production for cheaper than what you would have gotten if you had extended Obi. So that's why I do think that the Knicks probably opt for one. And yes, Emmanuel quickly is playing really well right now. So you could make an argument that this is the time to sell. To me, I'd really rather not. I'd really rather just focus on the fact that Emmanuel quickly is playing phenomenal basketball. Room for improvement, of course, but that's the type of player you want in-house. You don't necessarily want to move them unless you're absolutely wowed by a trade. And I don't see what that would be at the moment necessarily. So yes, yes, Dirty Dancer. At least ink one of them, assuming at least one of them's here. And if they're both here long-term, then re-sign them both. Chance Little. Who's more likely to blow it up, Bulls or Raptors? I have to go with the Raptors because the Bulls are basically in a sunk cost situation where, like, wh what do they do? Let's say they blow it up. All right. Well, they still probably don't get to keep their pick this year. And then they get to be bad next year. And then the year after that, they have to deal with the Spurs being able to take their pick back. So I think if you're the Bulls, what you probably want to do, the smart thing would be potentially just give it up. This is not a core that's worth going in for. It was never a core that was going worth going in for. You know, I know Bulls fans got their kicks when DeMar DeRozan had an incredible regular season last year and he did, but it was never about the regular season. The moves they made were about the playoffs and the Lonzo injury has really hurt them, but they're kind of stuck. Like they they're paralyzed to an extent. And it's almost like they have to keep going because their philosophy is, well, we're really close to the play-in tournament. If we make the play-in tournament, we win one to two games. We're in the playoffs. Anything happens. And whether or not that's something to feel confident about, I don't know about that. But it's just like that's the philosophy. Whereas if you're the Raptors, they truly are a team where their contract situation is very different. You've got 
Gary Trent Jr. is going to hit the free agency market this year because he has a player option. You know, Fred Van Vliet is going to hit the play. He's going to hit the free agent free agent market as well. The year after that, Ananobi, uh, Siakam, and before you know it, it's if you start stripping the roster of its parts, do these players want to stay? Does Pascal Siakam want to sign a supermax contract, knowing if he's eligible, knowing that you know Gary Trent Jr. is potentially traded, that Fred Van Vliet might leave or be traded that OG Ananobi could be traded. And then if he signs that extension, you better believe that at a certain point, they're going to turn around, trade Siakam to a place that he has no control over. And, um, you know, he's already made a lot of money. So I'd be very curious if his preference is to find the team that works best for him. And listen, he could go to some other team and be traded, but I don't think that's the case. I think he's much more likely to pick a, a location, stay there and move forward. And the team that would that would acquire him knows if we trade for him, we can still offer him a five year contract. It's not going to be a potential super max, but it's still a five year max deal. So I have to go with the Raptors. Uh, from Junon, thank you very much for the contribution. Also, I should mention uh, thank you. Shout out to One Bev for the Pinot Noir. Long day at work, good day, but long. So thank you. Uh, from Junon, Cam slash iHeart for Gary Harris works under the cap. Thoughts? Also think our front office might be a gun shy messing with the current chemistry. Your thoughts there? Salute, guys. Love these and cap or no cap. First of all, thank you. Really appreciate it and appreciate the contribution. Let's start with the uh, Cam and iHeart part. The Magic probably don't need Cam Rush based on the fact that they will have their own first round pick and they will more than likely have the first round pick belonging to the Chicago Bulls. So financially, they, especially in a really good draft class, they'd be much better suited doing that. Um, in terms of Isaiah Hartenstein, you know, if you're the Knicks, you're going to want to replace Hartenstein with another center at some point. Um, who that is, couldn't tell you. But what they care about is they care about having three rim protectors at least at once. You know, it was... Mitch, Noel, and Taj, even though Taj is not really a five, but could play the five, whatever. That's the case. Um, Mitch, Noel, and, and Sims. Mitch, Hartenstein, Sims. So they need to find it somewhere. And it needs to be someone who's not just a center who can handle it, but actually someone who can play decent basketball. And I, I know Hartenstein is doing a poor job. Believe me, I know. I still believe fully. <laughs> Listen, we talk about a lot of these free agents that don't pan out for the Knicks. And at a certain point, as I said to John, you have to wonder, is it really the front office every single time that these players who shined in other locations were just flashes in the pan? Because Evan Fournier had a long track record of being a quality player. And now he's not. But I digress. It does work for Gary Harris, and Gary Harris does have the contract where if the Knicks wanted to do that, they could in terms of staying above the cap, entering 2024. Um, I don't think this is the move that they'd try to make. Just just doesn't seem to make sense. Andrew, if you don't mind putting it back up there, because I know there's a second part to that question that I want to address. Um, thank you very much. Also, the uh, yes, the gun shy. I... I'll say what I said at the, the beginning of the season. And I, I didn't mean it in a malicious way towards the front office. Just generally, it seems like they don't, they don't care. And what I mean by that is like, they're not focused on going in, in the way that fans might want. Like they know that there's more patience and we, as fans are so accustomed to front offices that get two, two and a half years and then they hit the road. So we're conditioned to be like, okay, well, Where's it at? And it, the truth is, it's really tough to win and build a contender, but it's also really tough to bottom out and build a contender. It happens to some teams, but it doesn't happen a ton. Um, and the pressure usually mounts by that point. So, yeah, I, I think it is. There's a little bit of hesitancy for sure. You know, I mean, there was the report last year of where the Knicks could have created cap space with the deadline deal, whereas moving Burks and Noel and Cam Reddish out, getting Dragic in getting some sort of pick comp they wanted a little bit more hindsight's 120 probably better off doing that deal than what they had to do in terms of moving burks and noel and the first um, and then having to also move kemba to create the hartenstein money so 
it's it's more just they're focused on a longer term future than we as fans are focused on. And I think it's important. They're they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. I'm confident they'll get there, but it's an in in intermediate that feels a little frustrating because why? Why can't we have it now? Because we're balancing both. But thank you very much, Juna. Uh, JD, I think summer of 2025 is the year the front office is targeting Giannis and Spida. The 2020 free agent class isn't that great, in my opinion. Um, it is 2024 is a very good class. I should I, I want to be clear about that. Um, whether or not, I mean, Knicks aside, you've got Jalen Brown, DeMontis Sabonis, DeJounte Murray, Pascal Siakam, and Anobi, as I mentioned, who's a tier below those guys. We know for a matter of fact that Jalen Brown, DeJounte Murray, and DeMontis Sabonis are all going to be free agents, um, unrestricted free agents. And if you look at how it's worked out in the last few years, a lot of the best stars have not even hit the market. And the reason these players are going to hit the market is because they the deals they signed they're not really eligible to sign a max contract and i mean i think all three of them are going to command one so that's the sort of mindset where how you how you do it how you wait and all that i'm not disagreeing about 2025 it's just there are other things to consider right like it's not just hey creating cap space because the issue with that is you do still have other contracts and other people that need to be paid right like if if for whatever reason, and this is really like something we would evaluate probably in at least 10 months, probably closer to a year, um, where it's like if the Knicks really wanted to go in that direction, we would get an inkling ahead of time. And, and it's possible, don't get me wrong, but I don't think that – I don't think they're going to try to do it with cap space, if that's clear, because of the way that cap holds work and the players the Knicks have and want – and the picks they have, I don't think it's a surprise that they want to make a giant trade. I, it's been reported as such. It, it just feels like that's what they're going for. They're not able to have a pick in the top of the draft. That's usually where the, the star talent is, especially right away. And it's hard to get rookies to contribute winning basketball at the moment that they become NBA players. But that's the sort of thing to consider. So if they're waiting to trade for a player, that also will have an impact on how much cap space they can have. But um, it's not that they're not thinking of 2025 because there are ways they can still go about it. It's more that I, I really believe their priority is much more on let's see what happens this summer. Um, let's see what happens later. That sort of thinking. Um, but 2025 is a little too distant and the math is a little unclean. But again, I'll, we'll, go, we'll go through it. I promise. That'll be future hour discussion. Until then, uh, 2025 is just so far out 2024 a lot closer a lot more um clarity there but still some work that needs to be done to get to that point uh brian valderrama if randall keeps up this level of play the big what if mitch trade is going to grow do you think the knicks will ultimately regret not trading for mitch uh so donovan mitchell look i mean here's the thing obviously donovan mitchell's playing at a high level i was and am very curious about how the Knicks planned on adding more talent around Donovan Mitchell. It's tough. Um, I I ran, you know, a quote unquote scenario where let's say the Knicks did this trade. Let's say they did RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly going out, Donovan Mitchell coming in. And at this point, you know, none of the other moves that would have been made afterwards have occurred. And what winds up happening is we get to a very similar position where the Knicks would likely have a decent amount of cap space in 2024, but not enough for a max, but enough for a player like OG Ananobi. And again, whether or not they choose to go in that direction in real life, I don't know. We'll see. In this scenario, it still would have been tough because the money would have actually been tighter than it would have been with what could happen in real life, but that's still hypothetical even still in my mind it was okay you've traded these unprotected firsts for donovan mitchell how are you adding around him how are you creating enough salary to do another trade a sign and trade what picks are you using how far out are these picks just i understand from from the fans perspective of like i wish that the knicks had acquired donovan mitchell i get it i completely understand 
it's just, it was so murky for me for how they were going to get to that level. And there were a lot of steps that needed to go through. And it's not that they couldn't accomplish it. I believe they could have. It's just, you're then trying to figure out who the right pieces are around him. Because if you've got Brunson and Mitchell, you don't need a guard, right? You're not going after Shea Gilgis Alexander. Um, let's say it's Devin Booker, right? Okay, well, your defense is going to be a dumpster fire with those three players. Um, is it Joel Embiid? Well, by that point, if you're trying to go through the process of it, he's 31, maybe 32. It just, it gets harder to figure out. So are we talking about Tatum? Like there are all these names that come up and that's why I don't want to in that. I'm, I'm glad we don't have to live in that world because I would have been very stressed about how you do it. I think the, it's a lot easier to trade for a star who's under contract through 2025 and then try to also get a 2025 free agent into the fold then basically trying to get Don and try to get a 2020 like, that didn't come out right. I think you have an easier chance of getting someone like Donovan Mitchell to New York as a free agent. If you want to cross that path down the line and Lord knows whether or not it happens, the Knicks are at least going to try to prepare for it. The question is though, are you going to, if you, if you didn't have, if you had Donovan Mitchell and you traded for him, who that person would be where you signed to get them to come here is because the math would be tricky with Giannis. It's less tricky with Tatum, but he's also on the best team in the NBA right now. A lot can change. So I'm at peace with it because I still know there, there are a lot of ways for them to build it. It seemed a little too premature. I'm also still just, I'm very curious how it works out with Cleveland. They have, they have ways to get out of it and to build around him, but they're not going to do anything drastic this year. And then they've got two years left before he is eligible to hit free agency. Are they are they going to do something drastic before that point? If there's a year left on his contract, are they really going to be like, okay, well, Don, we want you to stay. Um, we can move someone like Garland for a wing. And then what happens if Donovan Mitchell says, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Um, I'm, I'm gone. It, there's so many different things that are there. So, Brian, to get back to your point, I'm still at peace with it. He's having a phenomenal season. The Cavs are doing just fine. But similar to with like DeRozan for me, the trade was never about the regular season. That move was always about we're all in because we have to be all in because we believe in Evan Mobley. We believe Garland can be a great player. We believe in Jared Allen. And if any of those players doesn't take the leap that is necessary to mitigate their lack of wings, quality wings, they're in trouble. And if they're in trouble, they have to then worry about a ticking clock of, is Donovan Mitchell going to stay here? We gave up all this. We really need him to be here. So I'm I'm at ease with it. Efrain Lopez. So the latest discussion is Gary Trent Jr. Would he be a good move, even if just amounts to be a mercenary hire since he could just walk next year? I'm not really interested in giving up assets for the privilege to pay Gary Trent Jr. a lot of money, probably north of $20 million this summer. He's a good player. He fits a lot of teams. Don't get me wrong, but I think there are other teams that are more, I don't know if desperate's the right word, but it, it makes more sense for them to do it. And listen, Trent makes sense with the timeline. I believe he's 25 years old, 26 years old, probably it's 26. So it, like you can get there, you can acquire him and, and do what you need to do. He's just not a priority for me. I think their teams were fit wise. He makes so much more sense, but based on how this team's constructed, you know, he's, he's not a wing. He's a guard. I really feel like the Knicks need someone who can be a wing. It would displace, you know, Emmanuel quickly do some, pride. I just don't know where the minutes are coming from. And you could go small. I get it, but to go small and then have to pay him to bid against other teams to retain him. It's, it's just, it's tough. It's different from the Ananobi thing because you get a whole extra year of team control. And um, and he offers you something that is very different, which is just incredible defense. Um, Trent's a really good shooter, but it's just not, I just don't see him being the right fit here. So I wouldn't. From uh, Juan Sex Fitty Juan. Thank you for the uh, super chat contribution. Hello, Jeremy. 
Uh, why do breakout players like Grant or, Laura, or Lowry get praise, but Randall with similar numbers is seen as a net negative around the league? Um, it's a good question. You know, I feel like probably market has to do with it a little bit. I, I feel like there is this overwhelming desire by a lot of the members of the media who cover the NBA that they love small market teams because it's so hard to build and retain talent in the NBA and they just go out of their way to shower smaller market teams with praise. And I'm not even saying there are times where it's unearned. The Grizzlies are a great example where they have built their team almost entirely through the draft. And that's commendable. It just, it feels like there's a lot of sympathy with the smaller markets, right? Like Damian Lillard, great player loved by many. Um, He's a really likable superstar for a lot of people especially for the national media. And I just feel like, oh, well, look, you're pairing this player with that player. Like, there's no one on the Knicks who is just lovable from the outside perspective for whatever reason. Like, And it should be, in my mind, Brunson. But there's always like, yeah, but, you know, Brunson's good, but he's not that good. Like, he's, he's maybe in the all-star conversation, but he's not he's not a, a complete star. Like, Tyrese Halliburton, I, I I don't mean this is shade to Tyrese Halliburton. I'm not going to pull a Wally. He's a really good player. He's going to make the all-star team. But it's the sort of thing where he went to Sacramento and he he just says the right things. He's a really smart dude and he's a great player to boot. And when you pair that together and then it's, oh, look at what the Kings did. They had this guy who we all love. And and yeah, I get why they traded for Sabonis, but like he wanted to be there and, and now he's gone. And then it just followed him to another smaller market where look what the Pacers are doing. Like, and they are they're right now. They're a good success story. Again, not trying to throw shade here, but it's just, it feels like when you're in a larger market, there is that target on your back. It sucks that we can't just enjoy what is incredible basketball right now from Julius Randall. And not just we, but just as a whole, like the ringer came out with their list and it's like, all right, the Knicks, are one of the better teams in the NBA. And I guarantee you, if you pulled every single person who contributed to that article, they would have had the Knicks as maybe a lower seed playing team. And sure, there's still time for that to potentially happen. Hopefully it doesn't. But it's this, like the fact that the, the highest player on their list was 51. Like it's geared for us to talk about it. Um, and they just love to shower these these players in smaller markets with praise. So you know, wish I, I wish I understood, but I don't. So that's, that's my take. That's why I think that's the case, but thank you for the contribution. Uh, Reynaldo Maldonado. Hey, Jeremy, if I was the Knicks, I would not trade any pick for this year's draft. It is loaded. What would you do? Well, I think it really depends. I guess this is a really good draft class. And that's why I think it's important that the Knicks have a player that they draft from this class. As I've said, I understood completely why they would trade out of last year's draft. I would have a harder time rationalizing it. Again, if the angle is 2024 cap space, that's one of the reasons why you might want to do it. But you probably don't want to do that because, again, like, all right, you've now gone two straight draft classes without really having potential rotation help. And I, or, or even trade pieces for whatever it's worth. So it's not that I wouldn't trade any of them. Um, I would, if the deal were right, but I'd also want to find ways to do moves around the margins to ensure that there's coverage or you can make a swing and still have a draft pick, right? Like just talked about the Cam Reddish thing. Like if you're able to add seconds to a deal to get into the late first for a team that has three first round picks already, like is that something that's of interest? Then you have three first round picks. You have more flexibility to trade up, um, trade out, trade the picks away, whatever it is. It's just, it's more. I don't think the Knicks necessarily need two, um, two first round picks, but there could be a lot of roster upheaval and, and who knows, but as things stand, you know, it's easy to see a player on the wing sliding in there from, from this rookie draft class coming up. But then is there another player that's drafted that's on this team that just is languishing on the bench? Um, and then I guarantee we as fans 
we're going to be upset because why did the Knicks draft this player to not get playing time and talk about development and all that. So definitely have at least one pick in this draft, but I'm a little bit more comfortable with the idea of trading out of it. If the deal is right, it has to be the right deal, but at least one. Thank you. Um, AG days, 26. Who do you think is a realistic and ideal star target for us to go after example, unloading all the picks? Um, you know, I'm really curious about how Philly is going. I don't think anything significant happens this off season unless James Harden just says, yeah, I'm out. And it's really hard to replace him. The way that I see it with the Sixers though, is they, they're probably going to fire doc rivers. If things don't go well in the playoffs and that will buy them a little bit more time. Uh, Joel Embiid is also under contract for three years, really four, but the fourth year is a player option. He'd opt out of that unless he gets hurt. So, you know, it's that it's, um, you know, I, I'm sure they'll keep their eyes peeled for other players. Like, yeah, I would imagine they'll keep their eyes peeled for someone like Booker as the Suns just can't tread water with him out. That's a pretty strong indication of what he's, what he's able to do for a team and what the Suns are without him. Um, and, you know, yes, they're missing Cameron Johnson. They have been, they haven't had Jay Crowder all year, but they were doing just fine at the beginning of the year without Jay Crowder. And, and it finally caught up to them. Um, and, you know, like, yeah, you could look at SGA as an option, but I really don't think that he's viable for at least three years. And I, I think the Thunder are also going to be a good team if you're OKC, unless SGA is adamant about leaving there's no reason to really trade him and then other than that it's like okay well who are some of the best stars that fit your timeline that would also be solid trade candidates like just looking at some of the, the best players that are performing this year like Jokic isn't going anywhere Mavs aren't trading Doncic for the next few years Curry isn't going anywhere and if he were he's probably gonna be what 37 36 which and he'll still be really good don't get me wrong but at a certain point, you want someone who fits a younger timeline too. Um, Anthony Davis, I don't see why they're doing it unless LeBron leaves and Davis opts out and then you could do something there, but he gets hurt every year. It is certainly a risk. He's going to be in his thirties. It's it's a little tricky. Similar could be said for Embiid, but um, I just view Embiid as a better player. So well, uh, no shade to AD is having an incredible year. Um, Durant's not happening. Dame isn't happening. Only reason I see Tatum going is if Jalen Brown leaves and he says, all right, well, I'm not going to stick around here, but that's not, I mean, that would be 2024. So sure. You can say, keep your eyes peeled, but they're the best team in the NBA right now. So it's hard. Like things can change, but it's hard to, to go off of that. Um, Markinen, I'm looking at the EPM levels. Markinen's up there, but he's not going to be that star. Jimmy Butler isn't going to be that guy given his age. Jaron Jackson Jr. I'm sure would be a target for the Knicks, but just not that he's not going to be dealt and he's not that level of, of superstardom. Curious what happens with Giannis. We just talked about Harden. We've had the Mitchell conversation. We just talked about SGA. Paul George is on the later side of, of, of 30, which again, is that clashing with what the Knicks want in terms of star talent? Um, Halliburton's not going anywhere. Morant, LeBron is 38 years old. If anything, you'd be probably signing him. But even then, I don't know. Zion's not going anywhere. And then we get to Booker. And, you know, there are other players too who I haven't mentioned. But to me, it feels like Embiid, Booker. It's probably where it stops right now. And then we'll see. Uh, Bioboy28. What about the rumors Clippers trade George if things don't go well this year? Uh, yeah. I mean, he's again, he's certainly a topic. I believe he'll he's 30. He's turning 32 this year. He's had some injury concerns. He's having a great year. Very underrated season. I just I wonder if there's a team. I have to think about this. Like if there's a team that is willing to get Paul George in a way that the Knicks aren't, you know, cause there are teams that could top the Knicks offer. I don't think it would necessarily be the Pelicans. Uh, cause again, he can also opt out. Like is Miami unloading every single pick that they have to get Paul George? It wouldn't shock me in the absolute slightest if they did that. Um, 
is it Phoenix? I mean, he he'd be great. It's a way to keep Devin Booker happy. It's a way to have star talent. Like you could always do that. The Suns have every single one of their first. So I think it's it's not that the Knicks can't be outbid for someone like Paul George. They can. Um, it's just I don't think that he's going to be a priority given age where the Knicks are at. All that I think they're going to be looking for someone just a little bit younger, a little bit closer to their prime. But he's a great player, obviously. And um, if he's dealt, it'll be it'll be to a team that I think would already have a main piece. And then you're going back to another pretty devastating one-two punch of that player and Paul George. Or maybe if Paul George is the best player on the roster, the second best player is really close in terms of talent with him. So um, I think the Knicks would stay away, but could go could certainly do worse than Paul George. Frank Sound. Hi, Jeremy. Can we re-sign quickly and Grimes with Jalen Brunson, RJ Barrett, Julius Randle, and Mitchell Robinson uh, on the books? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's more about what can the Knicks do in addition to that? Because if you re-sign all of those players, then you don't have cap space. So you're going to have to trade. You could trade other players, but you have to add to it. You have to add the picks. Like, if you wanted to trade for a star who is an established star, one who's not, you know, in the first seven, eight years of their career. And the reason I say this, because usually around seven or eight years, that's when a player might say, I've had enough. I'd like to leave. So I find someone later on. You then have to worry about salary matching. And it's tricky to do that if none of the players listed is involved. So that's, that's the tricky part. Like you, yes, Frank, you can absolutely do it. You can't do it and also build a contender. That's the really crappy part. At least one of those guys is going to have to go potentially two, um, probably two. Um, but that's that's just the nature of the business. If you want to build a legitimately great team, JD, why would Brown leave the Celtics? I've learned to first of all, I, I don't think he's going to leave. I should be clear about that. But secondly, I'm kind of done with personally, uh, just done with assuming like what makes sense for a player is what makes sense for them. Like we've seen so many different players moving in, in directions for reasons that don't seem smart, right? Like why would Kyrie leave the Celtics, especially if Kevin Durant just tore his Achilles? Um, why would Kawhi leave the Raptors when they just won a title and they have gotten out of the second round once and it was with Kawhi being injured. So he didn't even get to play. Um, it's just all sorts of stars who, leave for reasons that are sometimes inexplicable. You know, maybe, maybe Jalen Brown wants to go to Atlanta because that's where he's from. Maybe he wants to go to another team because there's something that's important to him. That's in that area. Maybe he wants to, you know, he, maybe he's perceived as a, as a Robin and wants to be a Batman somewhere. I, I have no idea, but it's the sort of thing where these guys just, they move and it's, it's just, why? Because I want to. Fair enough. Okay. So that's why I mentioned it. Just because he will be a free agent because he's not going to sign the maximum extension they can offer him before free agency. After that, you know, it just takes one team to have an interesting thing that appeals to him and he could be gone. But my money is obviously that he stays with the Celtics for that reason. Um Another example, as my wonderful producer just texted me, uh, why would Jalen Brunson leave the Mavericks for the Knicks when they just went to the Western Conference Finals? They have Luka Doncic. They could theoretically offer him the most amount of money possible, which they didn't, but they could have, for a team that missed the playoffs. Connections were a huge part of it. The role he wanted to be in New York, all of that. That was all important. But there's no like, the conversation after the Western Conference Finals was this was Jalen Brunson's coming out party. He was fantastic. Why would he want to leave this? And he did for for the reasons he left. 
If I were him, I'd understand why. If I were he, if I were he, I would be staying purely from a winning perspective. He wanted to win here. Thank God that he did. Because I love that man. So thank you, JD. Dirty Dancer. My main issue with Tibbs is that every year we have guys who are literally banished from the rotation. Why can't we be a normal franchise and quietly rotate guys in and out? Uh it's a good question. I mean, there are this it does happen to other teams, right? Like it doesn't we focus on the Knicks, so we're more aware of what the Knicks do, but yes, I agree. There's a lot of disappearing that happens. Um, Austin rivers, you're not cutting it for me. We're going to disappear. You Kemba Walker disappear. You Cam Reddish disappear. You like whatever it might be. Evan Fournier, like that's just how the philosophy is for him. And I'm not defending that. Believe me. Um, but that's just, it, it does happen. I wish it didn't happen to this point. I think to to Tibbs's credit this year, like he removed Fournier from the equation when he could have once Quentin Grimes was back. Like, like he's done a better job at least of you're not giving me what I need. Problem is when Hartenstein plays poorly, then you're like, well, but still, like and the, the answer is he just picks his favorites. And he always has. Uh, and he's always going to. It, it's not a meritocracy as much as it as, as we may like it to be, it's just not. So, um, yeah, it's frustrating. It's annoying. Like I said, it's annoying as a fan to see players who are, I know are quality players. And then they get to New York and they play under Tibbs and most of them aren't able to do it. And it's not because they are scared of a spotlight or that they're bad players. Well, for the most part, outside of Kemba, whose knee was just beyond repair and Noel who got hurt. But, you know, Burks is playing really well and he, he was good last year, but he's been great this year. And it's all about the role and how you're empowered. And um, he wasn't empowered. And so many of the players weren't empowered. And that's why the Knicks struggled to trade up for someone like Jaden Ivey. Because, and Alan Hahn even said it, teams had difficulty understanding what those players' values are because they didn't have the opportunity to shine. And the front office, Yeah. They added veterans that clogged it. And yet, Tibbs, for whatever reason last year, he banished certain players. Then he also banished younger players who were just trying to get the opportunity to develop. Last year was last year. This year is this year. He's been better at it. Still not optimal. Still not great. Um, but it, it's somewhat improved. I'm just happy that the front office took away some of the players that really were getting in the way like Derek Rose not playing um, moving New Orleans Noel so Jericho Sims could get more of an opportunity than he would have obviously they brought in Hartstein but still more of an opportunity moving Kemba Walker as that was untenable so uh, yeah I'd like to see him do better but it's sometimes hard to teach an old dog new tricks and um, it shouldn't be the way it is but it is yeah Taj. Thank you, Andrew. Taj was another prime example of that Timberwolves game still. Ugh, can't shake that one. That was a rough one. Uh, Juanon. Possible destinations for Obi. I don't want this to happen. Just trying to brace myself for it. Yeah, you know, I, I still think the Pacers make a lot of sense. I still think Duarte certainly would make sense for them too. Outside of that, you know, I mean, it's like if the Kings didn't have Keegan Murray, I would say the Kings because they they're a great team um especially in transition right like and i think that's the thing if you can find transition a really good team that's um running transition obi would do a great job of it so um you know where else that might be let's see like he'd he'd, he'd be a sigh of relief for houston considering everything they're going on that's going on there but they just drafted Jabari, so probably not going to be a fit for a place like that. Charlotte seems to be bringing back um, their player, all that. Um, so, you know, like there there are options elsewhere. I just, I think he'd do very well for a team that's, let's see. I mean, like he'd be great for the Jazz. I think, I think he would be. 
just because they have the ability to be patient. They will have the money to pay him when he needs to get paid. But I also don't know how he would play with Larry Markinen that well. Um, maybe he would, you know, like maybe, maybe they could play off each other just fine. Um, Sexton and Obi would actually be a lot of fun just pushing the pace. But uh, yeah. Uh, and the one thing I do want to add is uh, very cool. Um, so Andrew actually did uh, for tomorrow's pregame pod against the Pacers had uh, Caitlin Cooper, who's fantastic. If you don't know Caitlin's stuff, I highly recommend it. She just sees the game in ways I could never, ever in a million years see it. Um, they actually talked about Obi and Duarte. So I'm sure that uh, all of you would be listening to it anyways. But this is all the more reason to listen to that conversation because uh, I'm really excited for it because I bet Caitlin has some great thoughts on the matter. All right. Ben Kim Gurvey, Jeremy Grant's contract is up for extension, but at a much lower number than what he could get in free agency. I don't think the Blazers have the money sign and trade this summer. Uh, so, so let me break it down. Jeremy Grant is eligible for 120% of the salary he's earning this year. If he waits until free agency officially begins, he's eligible to sign a full max contract. Um, believe he's been in the league for seven to nine years. That would be a 30% max deal. I don't know if he'll get a 30% max deal. That's a lot of money for Jeremy Grant. He kind of does have a nice leverage point here though, because the Blazers can't afford to lose him since they traded for him. And, if, and it's really hard to replace him. But, uh, you know, Jeremy Grant, he left the Nuggets for the Pistons and what was a head scratcher for the same money. He wanted a different role. So I don't really know what the case is going to be there. Sign and trade is going to be really tough because we have to deal with our good friend base here compensation. And I just think that when he gets to the first day of free agency, he's going to sign a contract that's worth more than what he's eligible to sign for right now. And that would be that. Um, but it's easier for him to go to another team that can more easily create cap space or that has cap space and be there. So I, I would be surprised, especially because it probably means moving Julius Randle. I just don't think the Knicks are interested in doing that right now. And again, if, big if, if he continues playing in this way, you'd have to move him for something really really big in order for the moves to make sense. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think Grant is going to be a target for the Knicks just based on where they're at right now. And then, uh, I think, I think this last one, uh, <laughs> JD thoughts on the Correa saga, Jeremy. So I'm a Yankees fan. So I didn't have to worry quite as much about this, but, um, as I said to Andrew earlier, from my vantage point, it hurts because of the fact that the Mets really could have used him as a player. When money is not an issue because Steve Cohen has maybe more money than God, you worry about later, later. And I can tell you that as a Yankees fan, you worry about later, later. And sometimes later really sucks. But there's the issue is ownership that won't spend, not can't spend. All these teams can spend. They just... They choose not to. So, uh, and you know, I actually, I want to bring Andrew in here because maybe if he's, if he's so willing to very briefly discuss it, I know this is bad, <laughs> bad, bad, but I just, I feel like I can't, I can't talk about this without at least getting your thoughts. Brief. So man, here's where I'm at. And it is fitting that, um, first of all, JD had a, had a second follow-up. And it was when I figured you'd bring me on. So this works. He asks, is Andrew still a Mets fan after today? Um, Kevin Danishevsky does have a super chat that we'll wrap up with for real, but we'll also, mm -hmm. we'll also, um, I'll, I'll dedicate a couple minutes to this. So here's where I'm at. Like the Correa thing happened after so much else happened this off season to prove that things are different now. And it was almost like, they had already scored the touchdown and then the Correa thing happened. And now we get to like do the greatest touchdown dance ever. But because it happened like in the middle of the night, somebody else had already signed him and reneged on the physical. 
to then do the same thing. And these like 28 days went by between, or I guess three weeks went by between reported agreement and then this today happening. It was never real enough to be like, we lost him, but it was, it was enough of a disappointment to where the owner admittedly said, we're one, we're still a piece away that you can't help but be disappointed. Um, to answer your question, JD, I'm not as defeated as I, like in, in years past, the Mets have a history of like getting to the one yard line with a free agent. Vladimir Guerrero is an example. Alex Rodriguez, Jesus is an example. Um, uh, Juan Gonzalez is an example. And then it just completely falling apart. The Mets signed like seven guys outside of, outside of uh, Carlos Correa this off season. So mm -hmm. it also appears that this doesn't mean that they're out on free agents in the future. Um, it also doesn't mean that they're not, that they're out on like improving the team during the season. So while I would have, I was fine with not having to answer the question about the left side of my infield for the next six years, man, there must be something really wrong with this dude's, ankle at least something projected to be really wrong with this dude's ankle that they decided to make the most financially irresponsible owner that i've ever seen back out of a deal like this um so yeah i'm like i'm not like oh wow this off season's a failure now but i'm obviously disappointed carlos Correa would have been amazing you know yeah, you would have. Well, what if I told you there was actually a great option still available if you're interested? Um, what if I told you that there was someone on the market, three-time All-Star, uh -huh. won an MVP award, MVP, two-time yeah. Silver Slugger award winner, Hank Aaron award winner. Uh, he was actually the NL Comeback Player of the Year, and he led the AL in RBIs. Um, and, you know, you just need him for one season before you go after Manny Machado. Mm-hmm. I think Josh Donaldson would make a great addition <laughs> to the New York Mets. I will He'd be great. With, Take him. I will please, the... <laughs> please, <laughs> please. I will switch, stick with the switch hitting. Uh, hopefully, better than just better than just in September. Prowess of uh, Eduardo Escobar. Ironically, like the Mets' number one prospect was a catcher, and the number two prospect was. A third baseman, Brett Beatty. Mm -hmm. So those are two positions of need. There is a world now that you just plug the kids in and see what happens. I once again was very intrigued by the the notion of wow. So like the next the next decade is Carlos Correa and and Francisco Lindor on the left side of the infield. Okay, the natives are restless. They would very much like for us to stop talking about baseball. You're, yes, that's totally you're fine. You're welcome, by me. JD, for answering your question. You're welcome, anybody that wanted to get the the statement, um, get get our thoughts on on what happened with Carlos Correa today. Uh, we will wrap up with the one and only Kevin Danishevsky. Kevin, all right, thank you, Kevin, for the super chat contribution. Uh, what would a Devin Booker deal uh, look like? What do you see the likelihood he asks out in the next year or so? The Suns ship does seem to be sinking. Uh, well, any Devin Booker deal, it's got to start with at least three unprotected first round picks. It's going to deal with pick swaps. Might cost a fourth just because of the fact that Devin Booker is signed through, I want to say, 2027? Might be 2028. Um, no player option either. It's full, full four years tacked on. So he can't even be traded this year for whatever it's worth, just because he signed that extension. And um, yeah, it basically, like it, it all, it all depends on timing, right? So I'm gonna look up his contract just to be absolutely sure in terms of the math I'm saying is correct here. I think just want to be fully accurate. So he's got yes, he would have been a free agent in 2024. Um, $36 million is what he's earning in the 2023-2024 season. It jumps up by $14 million projected because it, it's still going to be 35% of the, of the salary cap, and that cap hasn't been set yet. Um, so it's going to be at least $50 million. And now if you're the Knicks, you've got to figure out, well, if we trade for him next year, or, you know, whether it's during the season or 2024 draft night, that's when his salary 
is a lot smaller. So you don't have to worry as much about doing it. Uh, it would make sense that one of the pieces going out would also be RJ Barrett, right? A wing for a wing. You have to find another way to add some more salary there, probably at least eight or $9 million, maybe a little something in that ballpark. And on top of that, it's not just like, oh, here's like mess salary. It's got to be someone really good. Again, you're getting, yeah, it's, it's through 2028. You're getting four years of Devin Booker if you're trading for him in 2024. Four years of Devin Booker, and he becomes an unrestricted free agent at the age of 31. He's really on the younger side, always has been in terms of the draft. So if you want him, you got to pay a lot for him. And, uh, you know, I, I still think there's time for the Suns. It's the sort of thing where, yeah, like peak value, probably this summer, because then you can say, hey, you don't have to give up 40 plus million dollars in salary to get him. You could go closer to 30. But the issue is, if we're trading him to your team, we're then giving you five years of team control. That is, I mean, for context, Donovan Mitchell went with three years of team control. And I didn't even think he was going to go because we really hadn't seen that before outside of Ben Simmons, which is a weird case in and of itself, who was traded for a better player and James Harden. So, yes, uh, the sun might be setting. Uh, uh -huh. but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will move on from him soon. I still think they're going to try to work with it. I still wonder if um, the person who purchased the team, if he's going to want to keep this team together as best they can, add to it even, try to be better. Probably if I were he, I wouldn't want to say, yeah, I put $4 billion on this team. I'm cool with them being worse and stripping it to spare, you know, making it out of spare parts and all that. So I think he'll still be there for a couple of years, but you never know. It could be summer of 2025. There's a free agent, right? And they're like, I want to go here. Devin, you want to come with me? And they basically do exactly what the Clippers did, which was um, sign a player and trade for a player. And you trade everything for the player, but it's a two for one deal. So it makes a lot of sense. So uh, yeah, Kevin, I would say it doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now, but Maybe in a couple of years we can reevaluate. All right. So thank you so much all for tuning in tonight. Um, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, follow KFS on social. Um, also, reviews are great. They're five stars. So we'd love if you could please contribute five-star reviews. We've got some awesome content coming up. As I mentioned, uh, the pod with uh, Caitlin Cooper will be out right before the Pacers game. That's going to be super important. Uh, we have a watch party. I unfortunately will not be in attendance for the watch party because I will be in attendance for the actual game, which I'm very excited about. But we will have, I believe, John, Benji, Andrew in attendance. Um, it's for Patreon members who are in the um, mellow tier and up. Right, Andrew? Uh, if you Yes. Three, three to the dome. Yep. Mm. And uh, yeah, you know, got some great content. Coming up after that, as always, it's an honor and a privilege. Really appreciate all your, your thoughtful questions. It's a lot of fun. Always great talking basketball with you all. So uh, thank you. And um, I'll next see you, I believe, on Sunday after the after the game. So uh, be well. Let's go, Knicks. And, um, you know, they go two and two this week. Sorry, John. And sorry to you all. That's the way it goes. Adios. <laughs>